right, so I thought I would do a little walkthrough through my perspective of eight multifunctional medicinal herbs that we're definitely gonna be using in our medicine chest. And we're starting to grow some of them, so I'll show some of them here. But um, I basically will take you through uh, what they look like, how you can identify them, and what they might be used for. Okay, so this is the first herb that I'll actually highlight. And this is Achillea millifolium. So this is a, what I've determined is a really important herb for us in our medicine cabinet. And you'll see it kind of has this faux umbel, but it has these composite flowers. And it's on top of this really beautiful feathery gray stem. And it has these leaves that are deeply dissected. And I think about this, uh, this herb, and I think about that it's used for deeply dissected wounds. So that's how I kind of recall, you know, that this is something that is also known as wound wart. Um, it's known as Achilles herb because it was put on his heel when he got wounded. And millifolium means thousands of leaves. And what it basically it refers to is these, the fact that these leaves are really deeply dissected. So it doesn't have like thousands of leaves, it just happens to be really dissected. So what was really interesting about this plant is that some folks were saying that this is not native. And I learned that this was an, a non-native plant, but that could actually uh, be slightly wrong. So. There were two scientists, I believe by the name of Mulligan and Bassett in 1959 in the Canadian Journal of Botany. And they looked at 300 herbarium specimens and concluded that the common Achillea of North America is actually a tetraploid, and that was known as Achillea lanulosa. And I actually recently went to an herbarium and asked to see some of the Achillea that had been collected. And lo and behold, it was considered Achillea lanulosa but that has now been considered now a subspecies of Achillea millifolium. So it's Achillea millifolium subspecies millifolium. And that one is a tetraploid and the Eurasiatic one is a hexaploid. So it's basically the same plant, it just is a different subspecies. So the one that we have here in the Northeast is Achillea millifolium subspecies millifolium, which used to be known as Achillea lanulosa. So the other thing too is that this does have a scent to it. I would say it's quite slightly sweet, maybe a little piney or a little chrysanthemum-y, but I have like a little hint of jasmine as well in it, which is nice. And it really is the leaves and the flowers that are actually collected for medicinal uses, but they're also edible. So you could use them for garnish for, you know, maybe your salads. And it was known as old man's pepper. So if you dried the leaves and the flowers and you ground them up, then they could be used as like a pepper substitute or something that's a little zingy to add some spice to your, your dishes. So how I would actually use this plant, I may have covered this already in my medicine cabinet at least briefly touched upon it, but it's really known as a wounded warrior remedy and it's for, you know, staunching any kind of bleeding or deep cuts. It's the plant that I had Sonder turn to in our garden because there's a lot of cultivated varieties of yarrow or Achillea millifolium. And, you know, he basically crushed his finger and had a big gash on it. And I was like, well, clean it out and then put this Achillea millifolium on it. And basically the astringency helps with healing the wound. So if you have a deep cut or if you have anything with blood, like blood blisters or a bruise with bleeding, then this is a perfect plant. But it also has like antiviral capabilities of it. And so if you're actually ingesting it as a medicine, so say as a tincture or as a tea, which I will often use it as a tea, it could be very good at accelerating fevers and breaking a fever faster. So that's great if you have like say the flu or if you have pneumonia or just the common cold. 
throughout history, I mean, it's been used for everything from like typhoid or malaria. And I think that's really important to look back in history as to what it was used for and what it can actually be used for now. Other things that it could be used for is like any kind of complaints as far as your digestion goes or lowering your blood pressure. And I will use it mainly as a tea, but I also have it as a tincture. And I personally like using it as a tea with uh, Sambucus canadensis, so or, or Sambucus nigra, which is elderflower, and then using it with Monarda fistulosa or um, amentha, like a spearmint with some honey and tea. So that's like a really good uh, flu remedy. So yeah, that is yarrow or woundwort, um, otherwise known as Achillea millifolium, or the herb of Achilles with thousands of leaves. All right, so this one you can't really see because it's not in flower. I recently just planted these. This is Botanica or Stachys officinalis, otherwise known as wood betony or purple betony. Sometimes it's called lousewort. Um, lousewort probably because it was used to, to treat uh, lice or to get rid of lice. But anytime something is known as officinalis, then you know that that was a great medicinal herb. And this has kind of fallen out of favor. So typically this plant has this like kind of fuzzy, you can see these really cute kind of roughly little leaves around the edges. And then it will get this really nice, mint, like it's a mint. And so in the mint family, you'll have this square stem and it, it stays quite small. So maybe like 12 to 14 inches high. And it's, it's a pretty plant. I mean, I would, I would plant it in my garden just as uh, an ornamental but it has reddish purple flowers and these hairy dentate leaves below, but it's like a, a dentation that's rounded along the edges of the leaves. I would say that the smell of this plant would be a little, a little citrusy, maybe more citrusy than a minty, even though it's part of a, a mint family. However, if you actually brew this as a tea, uh, if you don't have any black tea, then this is a plant that you could brew as an alternative to a black tea because it has this astringency to it. And any time that a plant has this kind of astringency, then it, um, it, it typically is something that is, um, is, a nice, is a nice medicinal. So in this case, this plant is more cooling and relaxing, so it could really help tonify and relax your nerves. And it's a great plant for headaches and migraine. If you have any kind of uh, congestive symptoms, then it's really good for that. In fact, if you use it with like a skull cap or with linden, then that's actually quite good. And it's also a decent digestive. So it has this kind of bitter flavor. And again, that astringent quality. So. It's, it could be great as a digestive. You could use it with your dandelion root or your burdock root or anything along those lines that you would use for a digestive. There are definitely a lot of uses for this plant and I'm probably um, underselling it, but those would be some of the, the main uses for us. And basically you could use the leaves, the flowers, the stems, and the leaves are typically best before it flowers. So that's kind of typical, like the energy in the plant is in the leaves. And then when it actually starts to flower, the energy goes towards the flowers. So you could use that as an infusion or a tincture. And then if you're actually tincturing it, you might want to use a brandy or uh, that might be a little bit more palatable than like a, a vodka, for instance. You could also use this plant in combination with yarrow if you have any kind of internal or external bleeding. If this is gonna be hard for me to film because it's under here. I just started planting this plant. Let me see if I can get to it. Can you see this? Mm, let me see. So this is Hydrastis canadensis, not this. This is Sanguinaria canadensis. This is Hydrastis canadensis. And it has this almost like this uh, palmate shaped leaf around the edges. There's a chipmunk running through here. 
Okay, so that plant that I just showed you is golden seal. It's also known as yellow root. And the reason for that, it has berberine, which gives it this yellow coloring within the root. It's very iconic. Um, we are taking out a lot of uh, berberus thunbergii. There's also berberus vulgaris, which is the barberry, Japanese barberry, popular ornamental. And actually, when I was taking out, somebody had mentioned to me, uh, you know, that's a, that's a really good medicinal. And I actually <laughs> was so focused on removing it because it's an invasive here that I actually didn't realize that it, it had the same kind of yellow root as golden seal. And it's actually probably better used for medicinal than golden seal because, you know, I started planting golden seal. It's gonna take a while for this to populate, but it's definitely a plant that is over harvested. So I just want to have you be aware of that because oftentimes we don't want to pick plants that are over harvested. So we started to, to grow it. I think it'll take several years, maybe four to seven years to, to be in a harvestable state. I do have a little small amount of golden seal in the house and I will only use it for emergencies, but it is a plant that is used across a range of medicinal uses. Um, I do also have um, the Berberus thunbergii here though, Japanese barberry, it always comes up a little bit so you could harvest that. Another plant that has that berberine is also Mahonia, which is more common in the Pacific Northwest, though, though you can get an ornamental plant, it's called Oregon grape. We do, we have that planted as well here as an ornamental, but again, if you dig that root up, you'll see that it has that kind of iconic yellow root, which is how it gets its common name of yellow root. But there has been a research report, I think a more recent one, that was looking at the different types of chemistry associated with Hydrastis canadensis, with Berberus vulgaris and Thunbergii, and not with Mahonia. But they were looking at the amount of berberine within the plant, and actually golden root, golden seal, I am calling it golden root, golden seal, Hydrastis canadensis, has the most berberine actually. So it's probably the most potent of the plants. Again, they didn't look at Mahonia, but that was one that should be looked at as well. But again, you don't need to use it. There's other plants that actually have that chemistry. You'll notice it usually has a twin leaf that is more palmately shaped. It kind of has these ripples on it. It's slightly hairy. It gets a, a very like iconic little white flower kind of in the middle of the palmate leaf. And then that turns into a red berry. But the part that is used of the plant is actually the root. And again, for the uses, this is an all around good multi-purpose antibiotic. That's what it's mostly used for. So if you have wounds and particularly wounds that are clean, so you would not want to put this on a dirty wound because what happens is the hydrasis canadensis, the, the chemistry within the hydrasis canadensis will actually start to close up that wound. And of course, if you have a wound that is dirty, then it's not going to be removing that dirt. It's gonna get stuck within the wound. So it's really important that if you're using it, that you're using it on a wound that is clean, or if you have something that's clean, like a, like a, a slight burn, like a, maybe a, a one degree or two degree burn or a sunburn, you could actually use Hydrastis canadensis as well. Um, that will kind of be useful. But say you have a clean wound and you have the powder of golden seal, well then you could actually just kind of like put that directly on the wound itself. Some other things that it could be used for um, as a wash, so like as an eye wash, if you have something within your eyes, if you have red eyes, maybe pink eye, um, any type of gum diseases or canker sores or, you know, I just like burned <laughs> the roof of my mouth the other day eating something. I can't even remember what I was eating, but I, I still actually have a little um, uh, wound in there. Or if you bite your tongue or anything along those lines, you could actually use that as like kind of a gargle or a wash or a rinse. It's perfect for that. And actually I even have it as part of a, a throat spray. So I have a, it's a golden seal, echinacea, propolis, and maybe something else. But basically, if you have any kind of sore throat, um, you could use it as that. It's a great antibacterial, it's a great antimicrobial, it's a great antiviral medication. So those are things that I think that really make uh, golden seal shine as far as a medicinal plant. 
Some other things that I think hydrastis canadensis could be used for is that if you have a buildup of mucus, that actually happens here. Sonder has um, oftentimes a buildup of mucus. If you wake up in the morning and you have um, this extra mucus in the back, I have that sometimes. Um, this is very good at drying the mucus membranes. Um, also very good for uh, women and women issues with, the, with your menses. Um, again, has that kind of characteristic of drying the mucous membranes. Um, it is also a bitter. So whenever a plant is has that kind of bitter tonality, then it could be used as a nice digestive. But again, because this plant is very rare now, there's so many other plants that you could use as a good digestive agent. So, you know, dandelion root, for instance, is a great digestive and it grows everywhere here. Um, you could use burdock root as well if you could actually rip it out of the ground or you could actually get that at the supermarket. It's not uncommon. It's not common, but in like, you know, bigger supermarkets or specialty markets or along those lines, you can actually get um, burdock root. But again, burdock grows very um, liberally around here. It's something that you probably won't be able to over harvest. So again, really good um, digestives other than that. So I wouldn't necessarily use that for, for this. I would use this for specific types of wound treatment if I have to uh, basically triage, you know, what I'm using it for because it's so uh, rare and special. One thing I will note about Hydrastis canadensis is that it has a lot of contraindications. And basically that's kind of a fancy word for saying that, you know, you wouldn't take this if you have, uh, like for instance, if you're, if you're pregnant, um, you wouldn't take it for long periods of time because it could uh, have this uh, antithesis effect. It could actually harm you than help versus help you. So this is something that you would only take for no more than, you know, two weeks. You wouldn't take it when you're uh, pregnant and it actually does malabsorb B vitamins. So that's something to really take into account. You might actually end up taking a, a B supplement if you end up taking this for a longer period of time. It's just something that you could be aware of. And I think for any type of herbs, if you're gonna be dosing yourself with some type of herbs for medicine, again, this doesn't constitute any kind of medical advice from me. So I, I would say definitely look into um, the different types of herbs and what contraindications those herbs may actually have. And, um, and if you are going to try herbs, you know, try them a, a little bit at a time and see if they have any kind of ill effects with you. And of course, if you're taking some allopathic medicine, you know, look into that, maybe share with your, your doctor or your herbalist about what else you're taking to find out whether there's any kind of contraindication. So don't go like full on with something you know, if you don't really haven't taken it before, you don't know how it's going to react to you. But anyway, so that's Hydrastis canadensis. I keep on pointing back here because it's, you know, that's where we've planted some of them and we're starting to plant them in different um, parts within, uh, within our environment here. But again, it's gonna take quite a while for us to, to harvest those. The next plant that I would like to feature is one that I'm still familiarizing myself with. It's called Agrimonia eupatoria and it's known as church steeples or burr marigold. There's a number of other common names for it. And the scientific name actually refers to uh, a plant that has been used to treat cataracts of the eye. So that's something that kind of reveals a bit more of its use through its medicinal history, which is quite neat. Sometimes those scientific names actually do reveal, or even the common names do reveal some of its past history, which I think is, is really neat to be able to, to look back into that. I will say that even though the agrimonia part of it, the genus name, that one is referring to the cataracts. And I think Eupatoria, refers to a city within Crimea, but I'm not quite entirely sure about that derivation of it. Um, I will say that one of the other common names is liverwort. So again, probably something with like a, a cleansing or tonifying your liver as well. So that's something that, you know, again, is if you look at some of those common names that had been used, then you'll get a sense of what its medicinal uses are today. This is a really important medicinal plant. It's not one that I have had too much experience with, but when I noticed when I was putting together my Materia Medica or my medicinal cabinet here, agrimonia kept on coming up for various different types of conditions and ailments. So 
I wanted to point that out here because it's one that I'll be growing here at Flock and one that I'll be harvesting and tincturing and using as well. So something that you could uh, use to identify agrimonia, it has this tall leafless flower spike with five petaled yellow flowers. And it has uh, these, it's like a, I would say a deeper green plant and it's covered with these tiny hairs and the leaves have this sawtooth edging. So, you know, the way that I kind of described it, maybe you're like, oh, that kind of reminds me a little bit of a mullen, you know, the, the vivascum with like the tall flower spike. And you wouldn't be wrong. It kind of has that look of a, of a, of a vivascum or a, a mullen, a common mullen, but it doesn't get, you know, as high as a common mullen. And common mullen has these really fuzzy, kind of almost like light, bluish green leaves and very, very hairy. So that's something that you would say like is a, is a little different from Agrimonia eupatoria. So again, because the common name of this plant is um, called liverwort, then you could probably uh, imagine that it has this affinity for the liver and it's really considered a cholagogue. Now that's just a fancy term for saying that it actually helps to produce bile. So again, when I think of um, working with your liver, like if someone has maybe eczema or acne or uh, uh, maybe some allergies, I would start to think, well, maybe that's not something I would apply to one's outside perspective. Like maybe that's something that's actually happening in the liver. And then one thing that the liver does is it kind of helps cleanse, it, it takes out the toxins within the system. And if your liver is getting overloaded, then there needs to be another place for those toxins to be released. And again, your skin is your largest organ of your body, right? So, uh, and you have pores. And that's how some of the toxins actually re, uh, release from your body. So if somebody's dealing with like maybe like an acne or a rosacea or eczema or uh, these, you know, these allergies, your body is trying to rid of these toxins and that they might be using your next best organ to do that. And that might actually be your skin and that might actually be why you're having eruptions within the skin. So when I, I look at that, I say, okay, well, you know what, maybe that's something that you would need to tonify your liver. And again, agrimonia eupatoria would be a good solution for something like that. That's something that I would definitely think about or look into or consider for conditions such as that. So one of the other plants that we covered again, Achillea millifolium. This is a plant that uh, is very similar to Achillea in the sense that it has some astringency. And so you could use this other, if you don't have Achillea and you have Agrimonia, this can also be used to basically staunch bleeding. So this could be another alternative to Achillea millifolium. I would definitely move towards Achillea millifolium the, the most because it's the, the one that grows really wild around here. I have it cultivated. It's very easy access, especially, you know, kind of in the, the spring and the summer and the fall months. But then you could also use Agrimonia as an alternative or a backup if that's closer to you. In Chinese medicine, I will say that this is a plant that's being looked at as an important cancer treatment. So there's a, a, quite a lot of research that's coming out of China and other countries as well. Maybe not necessarily the states. When I start to look back at um, medical literature, a lot of the the herbal medical literature is not coming out of the US, surprise, surprise, but is really coming out of Japan or China or India, a lot of those Eastern countries. So, um, and, and sometimes also Europe as well, like Germany has a really deep history of using herbal medicines as well. And, um, and there, it's much more regulated actually over in Germany. So herbal medication is not necessarily super regulated here. Uh, it's, it's kind of a little bit more in the undercurrent, which kind of makes it you know, interesting and cool as well. But, um, but yeah, so I would, I would definitely look into literature along those lines, but agrimonia is used for that. And, and really, but I would say the affinity is towards the liver, the kidneys, the gallbladder, and can have some overlap with Achillea millifolium as well. 
One thing I will say is that uh, it's really the leaves of Agrimonia eupatoria that are used, but on some of the earlier flowering stalks, you can actually use some of the flowers and you could use it as an infusion or a tincture. You could also use it as an eye wash or a gargle. Um, I, I would say that if it's in full flower, then the leaves are probably not going to be as useful. So you try to wanna get it, if you're going to be tincturing it, try to get it right before it flowers because all of that good energy is being stocked up in the leaves before the plant is flowering. All right, so the next plant that I would highlight that we are definitely using a lot within our medicine cabinet is Calendula officinalis. And again, going back to that name of officinalis, that means that it was really used by the monks and other folks as a medicinal herb. So whenever you see that species name of officinalis, you know that it was a really important medicinal herb. And calendula is known as gold marigold or pot marigold. It's very, very common. I'm kind of jumping the gun here because I'm talking more about its uses than what it looks like because it has a very iconic look, but um, it's, it's used in salves. I mean, I use it in salves liberally, but let's go back to the way that it looks because it has this really beautiful sunny orange composite flower and it has these alternate dentate leaves. And again, it's a very common herbal within an herbalist's Materia Medica. It is a plant, like I said, that is used in a lot of salves. So if you have sunburns or burns or slightly sore muscles or any kind of scrapes or rashes or bruises, then calendula is a plant that's often used. I've seen it in also beauty care products. So a lot of those medicinal herbs will transition over very nicely into beauty care products. I have a calendula gel that I like to use in case I get like a slight burn. So if I burn myself on the stove top or if I grab a hot pan or something like that, then I'll often reach for the, the calendula gel. It has a specific smell to it. It's maybe, I would say maybe it has this kind of like resiny, kind of like a sappy, like a pine, not exactly like pine, but that kind of essence to it. So I wouldn't say it's like, you know, something that is, uh, turns me off or anything like that, but it does kind of have a, a relatively stronger scent to it. And the, the flower petals were actually harvested as an alternative to saffron. So if you're familiar with your spices, uh, saffron, is one of the more expensive spices and and then also with like vanilla as well so saffron you get it from the saffron crocus which we actually grow around here as well but to be able to harvest saffron like that so that's a really laborious whereas if you're harvesting the the like the little petals that are around the calendula then you could actually use that as an alternative spice. You know, I'm sure it was probably called like poor man's saffron or something like that. Just like, you know, Achillea millifolium is known as old man's pepper because you could use that as a pepper when you actually dry the, the flowers or the leaves and actually use that as a nice zingy spice. So that's something to consider when you're actually using calendula. You know, people sometimes like to sprinkle it on their uh, salads, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of like edible flowers out there. Violas are another one. Um, uh, I'm trying, I'm blanking on some of the names. You could do dandelion flowers, things along those, those, those are quite uh, pungent as well. But um, if you just use like some of the, the softer petals, that's actually, you know, really nice as part of a salad and could really brighten up that salad with the sunny disposition of that, of that flower. One of the things that you could do when you have calendula, and I wish I actually knew this uh, before when I, was, uh, when I was less familiar with the plant, I didn't know this, but now that I'm more familiar with the plant, um, it can be used internally and it's specifically really good for swollen lymph nodes. And I say I wish I knew this because just recently, um, not too, too long ago, Joey had um, this really scary, like swollen lymph node, like right in the back and it was rock hard, like right towards his uh, neck area. And he was traveling and ended up getting both typhoid and typhus. I didn't even think about like those two, two things are two different diseases because um, they sound very similar but he ended up um, having to get treated for that and his lymph nodes were like really swollen, specifically the one towards his neck. And I had a situation where I got my tetanus shot. So, you know, that's typically good for like 10 years. And I had to ask my doctor what kind I got. It was like some kind of Tdap shot. And I thought I had a, um, 
at first I thought I had some kind of tumor growing, but my lymph node, and it was the same arm that I got my vac vaccination in, and my lymph node was so swollen, and it was swollen for like six months. It was very, very scary. In fact, I went back and saw some of the medical literature, and I asked them specifically what kind of vaccination I got from that tetanus. And it turned out that and uh, one of the symptoms was really swollen gl glands on a certain segment of people. And I just happened to be that person. But I was like, I didn't know what to do with it. I was like trying to gua sha it out. I don't know if you know the gua sha, but you're like, you know, you use it to kind of like uh, scrape your skin very close to the skin. Um, and I think I would have, I would have taken calendula really and, and to help with that swollen lymph nodes. So that's something that's, uh, it's really used for internally. And you'll see people will use it as a salve, as a poultice, as an infusion, and as a tincture. So it's one of those plants that could be used across the board. And again, one of those plants that I would definitely have in my medicine cabinet. Okay, so the next plant I have on my list is one that grows commonly here in like in a disturbed sites or around roadsides and everything along those lines. And again, if you're collecting plants and you're not growing them yourself, I wouldn't necessarily uh, collect around a well-trafficked roadside, for instance, that gets all this kind of uh, gas fluids and, um, and uh, fumes and salts and everything like that that could come off the side of the road, oils, anything along those lines. So if you, if you find like a, a dry meadow or anything along those lines, then I would actually collect plants that way. And again, collect responsibly, collect on your own land, or if you're on private property, ask the person who owns that property before you actually start collecting any plants. So I will kind of throw that in there. But I am going to say St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum, is a very common plant. It's not native to here, but it's kind of this shrubby perennial plant. It has this nice bright golden yellow flower. And it's called Hypericum perforatum, perforatum, because it refers to these little oil glands on the back of their kind of like bluish green leaves that look like perforations, like little black perforations. And those are the oil glands. And I believe that's where the species name of perforatum comes from. So you'll kind of see this plant. It's, it's relatively tall or shrubby unless you actually, you know, mow your lawn, it might actually be a little smaller, but it has this really beautiful bluish green cast to these tiny little leaflets on it. And like I said, sunny, yellow flowers with like almost like whisker-like little stamens kind of sticking up out of it. So it's not necessarily the most attractive plant because of its, you know, form, but uh, it's one that is so common. And I think one that s people know as a medicinal because it's commonly used for depression and it's been used very successfully for depression. One of the contraindications though, is that you wouldn't be using it if you're on SSRIs. So if you're on allopathic meds and you're using also this, it, 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 those two don't go together. So that's something that you would definitely, you know, speak with your herbalist or your me medical practitioner or your physician or your doctor with about whether you're taking actually something, you know, for that. But Hypericum perforatum is used for other things as well. So I often use it in, uh, in salves. I combined it with calendula. I may even combine it with arnica, but it's, uh, it's used for kind of burns or sore, sore muscles. I will say that it's not as effective probably within a salve than it is if you're tincturing St. John's wort. But the salve is often used as a personal care product, a beauty product, or something for, like I said, sore muscles or, you know, burns, for instance. And what's interesting about it is when you're extracting um, Hypericum perforatum, whether you're extracting it with an oil or with an alcohol, is that it turns bright red. And I think that's a really cool quality. It's similar to when you extract um, chamomilla or chamomile, or, you know, sometimes tanacetum, I think they also have the same kind of chemistry, but it pulls out that kind of blue color. And you're like, wait, where, where is this blue color in this plant? And the same thing with Hypericum perforatum, you're like, where, where is this red color coming from? But that's also a really, I think, a beautiful but surprising quality for, for people to um, see when they're actually working with the plant.
So in addition to using it as a salve for whether it's like burns or scrapes or sore muscles or anything along those lines or sprains, for instance, you could use it with like if you have a broken bone or a sprain, using it with comfrey or using it with arnica if you have a, the sore muscles. One of the other things is that it's a, an antibacterial, it's an antiviral, and it's an antitumoral plant. So those are things that um, you, start, you could start reading the medical literature and you could see that it has, uh, you know, copious amounts of information in regards to Hypericum perforatum. So if you think about these plants, they're just really complex chemical powerhouses and they have evolved over time to be able to handle really uh, intense situations and a lot of stressful situations. You know, we could pick up and go or pick up and move if there's a stressful situation, right? You know, that's something that we could do. We could diffuse tension in many different ways. We could take different types of medicine, but the plant can't. They have to produce all that type, different types of medicine. So when I'm sharing this information or when you hear it from somebody else about like, well, look at uh, all the amazing things like that this panacea could do. In a way, the plant has to do that for itself in, in the place that it is, or it probably wouldn't survive, right? And if you're actually harvesting plants, um, maybe you wouldn't want to harvest it from your, your garden bed because, well, maybe your garden bed is there for display purposes. But if you're using really rich soil, then ideally that plant might not be the best plant to harvest because you want to actually harvest it where it's out on like dry craggy rocks or or dry lands or meadows that don't have a lot of good soil because it ha it's being forced to actually produce some of that chemistry itself and that's something that i really picked up and learned also from uh, Steve here who does uh, shiitake mushrooms so medicinally it's better to grow shiitakes out in the environment on a log that's dealing with all the different weather and climactic changes versus one that's grown indoors and uh, completely given exactly what it needs because it doesn't have to produce all that own uh, of its own chemistry to survive on its own. So I think that was really prescient and something that we should really consider. You know, obviously if you're trying to harvest the Hypericum perf perforatum or the Kilia millifolium and it's not growing anywhere, accept your garden, then of course go to the, the one in your garden. But if you see one, you know, in your dryland meadow down the line, then actually go pick up that one because that one probably has more medicinal benefits. So the parts of the Hypericum perforatum that are used are the leaves and also the, the petals. And it's the oil glands that I was referring to that give its iconic name perforatum that are on the back of the leaves that actually really give it its, its red color. So when you're using it to kind of pull out the good chemistry, whether you're using oil or you're using a glycerin or you're using uh, an alcohol, that's some of the, the red oils that are being pulled out from those leaves. So again, don't be too surprised if you're, if you're actually doing that and you're tincturing the plant or you're making um, a salve from that plant, you will see some of that that red oil getting uh, caught up there. And then, and it's really beautiful. I mean, it really gives a, a nice rosy color to your mixes. One thing I will say is that some of the contraindications similar to Hydrastis canadensis is you wouldn't use this over a long-term um, time. So there are certain plants like chamomile that you could use over a long-term, but uh, something like this, um, the Hypericum perforatum or the Hydrastis canadensis as an example, um, wouldn't be used for a long period of time. So the next medicinal herb is one that uh, I really have great affinity towards and I think it should be in every medicine cabinet. And if you could grow it outside, then all the better. And that is Chamomilla, Matriarcha Chamomilla, or Chamomellum, I believe is the genus name for the Roman chamomile, and there's also German chamomile. There's also a Moroccan chamomile, but that's a completely different plant altogether. The German and the Roman chamomiles are used very similarly, and the German chamomile happens to be a uh, much taller and the Roman chamomile is more uh, cl is closer to the ground maybe I would say even grows six to eight inches and is common to actually plant in between kind of walking stones or as an alternative grass I actually planted some here as as an alternative grass and it's really really starting to spread but it has this kind of iconic composite flower so you have like the yellow sunny inside kind of inflorescence on the inside and like the white stubbier petals along the outside of it. And it has um, a really beautiful leaf, 
kind of like a ferny, lace-like uh, green leaf, and it has a wonderful, wonderful scent. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, I don't know if you've ever had like that, that um, uh, what is it called, pineapple plant. It really grows really close to the ground, not an actual pineapple, but it smells like pineapples, which is how it gets its name. Uh, I don't know if those are actually related, but they're, they kind of have that little sweet, a little slightly pineapple-y floral scent. I mean, you, you know, when you think about chamomile, I often think of like a sleepy time tea because it's a common sleepy time tea. It's something that is gentle enough to give children or to give people who might be actually sensitive to other drugs. This is a, a tea that's actually very gentle. It's known as a sedative. So it really is a nerving, it will calm your nerves. It will kind of cool you down. And it's often used um, very commonly with like maybe linden or passion flower. And again, those are other herbs that are nervines and that will help calm one down. I like to use it with like Sambucus flowers. So Sambucus canadensis or Sambucus nigra uh, flowers. So as a tea, using that with a little bit of honey, maybe even a little squirt of lemon then you know that's really perfect. So I have a big jar <laughs> of chamomile that we use for like chamomile tea, but you could also use it as a poultice and um, like, you know, like I said, an infusion for your tea. And you could also use it as a tincture as well. One of the things that I failed to mention is, um, you know, I think about chamomile and I got carried away with it being like, you know, something as a, a sedative, but it's also very good for flus or for fevers, or if somebody has like hay fever, or even some kinds of allergies, it's often taken for that as well. So again, it's one of those plants that has a very calming effect, but that calming effect can actually be very effective. And to my knowledge, I don't think there's any contraindications. Maybe some people can have an aller allergic effect to um, some uh, a plant such as that. But again, with any kind of plant, I would say just say, take a little bit of it, see how you react to, to it, and see if it's actually effective. You know, I have often used it as a tea for the evening, and it doesn't like, you know, make me go crazy like I, you know, if I'm having green or, or black tea, but it doesn't have the same calming effect as I think it does with like Sonder, for instance. So, you know, for to each his own, you know, everyone is a different person and therefore they have di a different makeup and a different constitution and herbs may react differently to those, to those folks and medicines will react differently to those folks as well. So that's something to really take into account when you're dosing yourself with herbs. Okay, so the final plant that I would love in my medicine chest and I would never be without is Monarda fistulosa. And I've started to plant quite a bit of Monarda and various different Monardas. So the Punctata, the Didyma, um, the Bradburniana, and the fistulosa. So some of those can be used interchangeably, but I wanna highlight the Monarda fistulosa one. And that one's called wild bergamot. And you'll see it kind of explodes on top of this square stem with this like light lavender kind of rosy flower that the hummingbirds and, and bees absolutely adore. And it's some, some herbalists I've seen actually call it sweet leaf. And it refers to the type of uh, the sweetness within the, the leaf itself. Not as sweet as like maybe like a Tulsi basil. I love that smell. It kind of smells a little bubble gummy, um, which I do use Tulsi as well. It's a very important um, herb, but not one that I'm going to be highlighting today. But uh, the, the Monarda, the wild bergamot, the Monarda fistulosa, has a very sweet leaf. But I will, uh, I will say that there's different chemotypes of herbs. And what that means is that depending on where the plant is growing, it may have a different, different chemical constitution based on what it needs for where it's actually growing. And that may actually give the plant uh, a more sweet tone to it or a sweet taste. Um, whereas in other places, it might be a little bit more pungent and bitter and peppery, for instance. So what you'd want to do is maybe taste a leaf and see what chemotype that plant is. And if you could actually harvest it from different places, to do a little taste test. And of course, if you don't have a discerning palate, that's something that you could actually develop because our, our taste buds actually regenerate over time. Um, and if you're not like 
you know, totally dulling them by having too many sweet foods or too many salty foods, for instance, then you can actually develop your uh, taste buds, which is quite interesting. So as you become and you start to uh, orient yourself to these herbs, have a little, you know, have a little taste if it's edible and um, see what it, see what you feel like it tastes like. So uh, this one is, uh, is common. You could be used um, out as an alternative to say like something like a peppermint or a spearmint. I like to actually use it in more mixes because of the fact that it's a, it's a little sweeter. And you could use the uh, leaves and even some of the flowers fresh and you could put that on salads and make it look like really beautiful. There's a lot, again, a lot of like uh, nice fresh leaves that could give complex flavors to your dishes. So it doesn't feel so basic and standard, but you're actually eating your medicine, right? So that's also um, very cool. Um, and, and, and do yourself a favor, when you're harvesting these herbs, leave some for the insects and for the pollinators, like, you know, the, the bees and butterflies and also the hummingbirds and things like that. I get such joy actually seeing them enjoy some of the, the plants that I'm mentioning here as well. So one of the useful things that this plant is used for is drawing out heat. So whether that's drawing out heat from the burn, from a burn that you might have or a sunburn or a first or second degree burn that you might have gotten from holding a hot pan, but it also takes out heat from the system as well. So if you're ingesting it, you know, maybe even as a cold tea, it will kind of remove heat from your body. Um, if you've gotten a burn or a sting, for instance, you could act, and it's in flower, you could actually chew the flowers and put that right on your burn um, as well. So there's lots of plants that can be used for, for that, but if you're in an area where you have this monarda, then that's something that you could actually do. Um, and it also is used for kind of digestive issues and a number of others. It's common as a tea. So a lot of the plants within the monarda uh, genus are known as Oswego tea. And that refers to Oswego, like where in the location that it's, it's from and had been used popularly as a tea. And one of, one of the characteristics of that tea is that it can actually be used as a nice digestive. One of the reasons behind the fact that it could be used as a nice digestive is it has thymol. So this is the same thing that thyme has, right? And so if you have flatulence, if you have like gas, <laughs> if you're kind of bloated, that's one of the plants that's really good for that as well. Um, so if you know that you're eating something that could give you uh, some, uh, some gas, then you might wanna have some Monarda tea handy right there with you. Something else I would say for um, Monarda, uh, specifically Monarda fistulosa, is that it can actually help reduce a fever. So if you've just gotten the fever, you may not want to actually take Monarda because a fever is useful, right? Your, your body's trying to heal itself. So if you want to, uh, you know, basically catalyze that fever, then you might want to take something like Achillea millifolium. But if you are towards the tail end of your fever and you, it's still kind of lingering, then you may actually want to take that Monarda so it kind of reduces the heat in your body. So you'll see the, the, the differentiation between those two herbs. And I think um, other things that, you know, I would say because of the smell of Monarda, it's often used as a, uh, a, a scent that could be good for bronchial issues. So if you're, you're having trouble kind of breathing or if you have like a, a bronchitis or anything like that, then you might actually want to bring up some of that scent um, as an essential oil, for instance, or even having it as part of the, the tea or breathing that, that um, scent in with a, um, heat and, and steam and water, then that's actually something that could be really good for clearing out your bronchial tubes. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many other things that these, this plant and other plants could be used for, but when really stepping back and looking at the medicine cabinet and looking at what plants are the most multifunctional, because you, can, you could have hundreds of herbs, right? And they take up a ton of space. And, um, and, and I don't wanna confuse like myself or my, my partners who are here with me, I wanna actually help them. So if I could just focus on, you know, maybe eight, 10, 12 different herbs that have these, this multifunctional approach, then those are the ones that I would want to turn to the most. 
And again, as I shared with you, these are just some of the different ways that some of these herbs have been used throughout time and also currently. So, you know, I would encourage you to look at ones within your area. I mean, most of these herbs actually grow, either they've been naturalized or they're native to this area. But if you're watching this and you're in a different part of the world, you might have herbs that kind of fulfill a lot of these needs and you find that are most useful in your herb cabinet. And again, I just have to reiterate, you know, herbs are just, and plants are just in general, just real chemical powerhouses. And I think that there is a role for them to continue, continually play in modern day times. And it doesn't mean that it has to supplant the benefits of like quote unquote modern medicine, right? Where we think about allopathic medicine, where we think of like the medicine that your doctor prescribes to you when you go to your doctor's office. That has a role too, but I think herbs also could play a very viable role. And what I like about them is that they're really empowering. You could grow them in your backyard, as I'm doing here, and some of them actually grow wild. They grow for you, which is pretty amazing. So if you can't get quote unquote modern medicine that you get on your pharmaceutical shelves, then you know go to your backyard and see what you have. And I know actually orienting myself to these plants and learning them and getting to know them and using them and seeing how they react to me or to any of my, my partner's health makes me feel like I'm just empowered. I mean, it is really empowered. Just doesn't make me feel empowered. I, I am empowered by doing so. This is just a long monologue to say, I hope this is really useful for you and that uh, you could use this as a foundation for building up your Materia Medica or your medicine chest. And again, um, tune in here more and I'll be sharing more information about herbs, particularly as we enter into the fall season and we'll see more, more and different herbs than the ones that we've seen in the spring and the summer months. All right guys, see you later. 10% of our Google AdSense revenue from this channel is reinvested back into the Finger Lakes community and is matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic. So your support here makes a big difference. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.